everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. To start off, a quick announcement. I recently launched channel memberships. What that means is if you hit the join button next to the subscribe button down below, you will get access to exclusive perks such as emotes during live streams, and most importantly, at the $5 tier, access to exclusive reaction content. I would really appreciate it if you guys would consider hitting that join button and becoming channel members. Anyway, back to this reaction. Uh, today we'll be watching The Longest Year in Human History, 46 BCE, by Historia Civilis. So last time we witnessed Caesar's triumphant, or maybe not so triumphant, return to Rome, Mark Antony had really messed everything up. He had ruined the political situation. Caesar had to return, set things right. We saw the emergence of Lepidus as Caesar's new right-hand man. Uh, he will grow to be a very important character over the next couple of years, in fact, even after Caesar is gone. Uh, so presumably, in this video, we will be continuing Caesar's journey. Hopefully, we'll be getting some more politicking, which Caesar is obviously very good at. Uh, so I'm excited to get into this one. Once again, please consider joining as a channel member. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. In the summer of the year 46 BCE, Julius Caesar returned to the city of Rome, a victorious mm -hmm. general. All of his military opposition had been squashed, and all of his enemies, save for Labinus and a couple of Pompey's sons, had either been killed or forced into submission. Man, Labinus, Caesar's old right-hand man even before Mark Antony, who has really turned against him and is now one of Caesar's few remaining enemies. Um, well, despite that, Caesar has returned a conquering general, triumphant, but like I said in the intro, maybe not so triumphant, because he returned to a city uh, of a lot of political issues, frankly, that he's going to have to solve. This precise moment when Caesar returned to the city was a major turning point in Roman history. For years, Roman politics had been getting weirder and more dysfunctional, but mm. now was the time when things really go off the deep end. Before Caesar could even make it back to the city, the Senate took it upon itself to offer him unprecedented political power. His dictatorship, which was due to expire in a few months, was extended for an additional 10 years. This I think this is the start of a, frankly, kind of sad trend that we will see from the Senate. Now, you can kind of see what they're getting at, right? They know Caesar is the man in charge, and so they want to try and get in good with him, so that they may retain some of their influence. I get it. But what we will see <laughs> over the next couple of years, particularly as we go into the reign of Augustus, is the Senate will increasingly become weaker and weaker and will increasingly be a body that just licks the boot of whoever is at the top. Now, we will see some resistance from the Senate to the reign of one single individual, which is, you know, kind of antithetical to everything the Republic stood for. But by the time we get to Augustus, and this trend will continue as the years go on, the Senate will just be filled with kiss asses, basically. They just want to make happy whichever emperor or whoever's in charge at the moment so that the senators can retain their privileges and their cushy lifestyle. Um, now, we're not at that point yet. The Senate hasn't denigrated to that point. But it, that transition has begun, for sure. This was unheard of, as the dictatorship was supposed to be a six-month emergency measure. Why did the Senate do this? If Caesar made a power grab, many in the Senate feared the worst. By preempting him, the Senate believed that they could keep Caesar within right. the bounds of the law. So, at this point, this action, even though it is the beginning of that long transition I talked about, you can understand what they're going for. Um, now, perhaps you disagree with the action taken, and you would have suggested the Senate do something different. But, regardless of that, you know, you get why they did this. And by attaching a time limit to their offer, they would be able to revisit this whole arrangement in 10 years' time. Caesar would probably be in a weaker position than he was right now, <laughs> and with a little luck, they might be able to push him into retirement. The Senate also gave Caesar permission to serve as consul consecutively for the next five years, which, mm. when paired with the dictatorship, would give him a free hand to push through pretty much whatever legislation he wished. 
Yeah, so at this point, they're trying to satisfy Caesar uh, and hoping that in the long run, they can preserve the Republic. Though, <laughs> I feel like even at this point, it would be fair to question these actions. You know, from what we've seen of Caesar so far, does he seem like the kind of guy who would just retire, go back to the farm, do what Cincinnatus did? I, I don't really think so. Uh, I would be very concerned, I think, if I was witnessing this, saying, hey, I get what you guys are going for, but I fear that by giving Caesar too much power, he's just going to use it to entrench himself. Um, and, I mean, that is basically what he did, though. Of course, it's far more complicated because he gets murdered in the end and everything's up in the air at that point. But, once again, I can see what the Senate is going for. I'm not sure if this is the best way about it, though. At this point, it's the end of a pretty lengthy period of civil strife and conflict. You know, maybe they just want to get back to business, get back to peace. They don't want any more fighting. You know, you can definitely empathize with that. Alongside this, Caesar was also handed a bunch of new powers. I'm not going to go down the whole laundry list, but they included hmm. the power to declare war and issue pardons whenever he wished. Whoa. This was some real authoritarian stuff. The Senate still held on to some legislative authority, but they were making one hell of a gamble. You know, we're crossing the lines between the legislature and the executive. I mean, that's uh, a prominent factor in American government as well, although, let's be honest, over the last couple of decades, the president's power has grown, and now uh, the president can basically go to war without the permission of Congress, even if they don't officially declare it, but that's not how it's supposed to be. <laughs> Um, and just as we've sort of broken that tradition, uh, in our republic, in the Roman Republic, they are currently uh, officially ceding far more power to their main executive. When Caesar returned to Rome, he asked the Senate to meet with him outside the Pomerium. He told them that he had conquered new territory for Rome, and that he had been hailed as imperator by his armies. He formally asked their permission to cross the Pomerium under triumph. In fact, he said that he was qualified for four triumphs. One for Gaul, one for Damn. Egypt, one for Asia Minor, and one for North Africa. A little greedy, huh? It's worth briefly explaining each of these claims. In Gaul, he had annexed a bunch of territory and been hailed as imperator. Gaul was totally legit. Yeah, I mean, that is completely fair. Um, I mean, we've already talked about some of the morality involved. Sweep that aside. It certainly was an impressive conquest. In Egypt, it gets more complicated. If you remember, Caesar lost a battle, then won a battle, then negotiated a settlement where he handed yeah. a Roman province over to the Queen of Egypt. Wasn't really a glorious victory. <laughs> I mean, Caesar made it out alive... I suppose that's glorious, but that whole thing was kind of embarrassing um, if we really look at what happened. Giving away a province is kind of the opposite of conquering <laughs> territory. The yeah. Egyptian campaign should not have qualified for a triumph. In Asia Minor, Caesar won a decisive battle, but all he really did was restore the status quo. Mm. That doesn't really count as conquering new territory, although I guess it's debatable. Yeah, shaky. As for North Africa, this one's really complicated. Caesar won a decisive battle, but in this case it was against his own countrymen. Yeah, that 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 seems really iffy, right? Because the whole point of a triumph, you know, you're celebrating uh, this glorious event. Uh, and oftentimes in a triumph, you will parade prisoners and loot through the streets of Rome. So what are you going to do? Parade Rome in a prison? That seems like it's in extremely bad taste to celebrate a triumph against your own people, I would definitely recommend don't have a triumph over the Civil War. I mean, he already has the triumph uh, in regards to Gaul. Um, and obviously, you know, just having one triumph in regards to Gaul, everyone's minds are going to be on everything that's happened since Gaul, but that's fine. You know, just officially have the triumph about your conquest of Gaul, which was super impressive, and then unofficially everybody knows what's going on. I definitely wouldn't recommend calling an official triumph to celebrate your victory against your fellow countrymen. Uh, it's not in great taste, particularly considering how divisive the Civil War was, uh, and I feel like it's kind of left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. 
For the sake of public relations, Caesar argued that King Juba of Numidia was the brains behind the North African campaign. <laughs> yeah, but this okay. was not true. After Caesar's victory, he shifted some of the Numidian client kingdoms into one of Rome's existing provinces, which is kind of just an administrative thing, but I guess technically counts as conquering new territory. Mm. Of Caesar's four proposed triumphs, three were questionable. Yeah. And I know that Caesar wants the four triumphs to celebrate all he's done, but to be clear, one triumph is already a massive accomplishment. Um, triumphs are relatively rare at, at this point, and at this point, they really mean something. Now, in the future, triumphs will be, well, they won't really happen at all, and they will only happen um, to celebrate the emperor. But... At this point, triumphs still mean something. They've got this symbolic importance. So even one triumph, I think, would be enough. Nevertheless, the Senate signed off on all of them. Of course. I'm going to spend a few minutes going through each of Caesar's four triumphs. But if this piques your interest at all, you should know that I made a video where I break down each step of the Roman triumph in yep. excruciating detail. We reacted Learning to that. about the Roman triumph ruins every parade you see for the rest of your life. <laughs> Caesar's four. Yeah, there were some, you know, there's some more fun aspects to the triumph. Uh, there's a lot of celebration, a lot of cool stuff. There's also uh, some less favorable aspects like killing prisoners uh, in something that looks very close to human sacrifice. The Romans were against human sacrifice. They didn't like it. But some of these summary executions during triumphs, you know, they, they're, they look kind of similar to what could be called human sacrifice. Our triumphs would be celebrated on four separate days in the order in which they occurred. Gaul, then Egypt, then Asia Minor, then North Africa. All right. The conquest of Gaul was Caesar's greatest achievement, and the Gallic triumph would serve as its living monument. Mm. Remember Vercingetorix, the so-called king of the Gauls? Yep. Six years ago, Vercingetorix led a united Gallic army. Uh, Vercingetorix, we, we miss him greatly. He was... Um, quite the foe of Caesar. You know, I think he really lived up to expectations, even though he lost in the end. Uh, and I mean, we talked about in that video on Vercingetorix how he's still remembered today. Uh, and there's sort of a revival uh, of his memory over the last couple hundred years as sort of a nationalistic hero for France. That almost succeeded in pushing the Romans out of Gaul. Caesar eventually captured Vercingetorix and defeated the United Gallic Army, after which Rome would establish a permanent presence in Gaul. Mm. For the intervening six years, which included the entirety no. of the Roman Civil War, Vercingetorix had been rotting in a Roman jail. Wow. I mean, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I just said, you know, it's glad to see him again. But to be honest, I hadn't really thought about him since Caesar had beaten him in Gaul. Um, I, pr I guess I just assumed maybe he died or something. I hadn't thought about him at all. To know that he's been rotting in a prison cell for years, that is pretty shocking. Why didn't they just kill him? Well, for the Romans, few things were more prestigious than having a foreign king walk in one's triumph. This yep. Roman tendency towards humiliation and cruelty extended Vercingetorix's life six years. Yeah, the Romans loved that. I mean, Vercingetorix wasn't to be honest, he wasn't really the king of the Gauls. He was more the leader of a Gallic confederation. But, I mean, he was the main figurehead uh, and leader of the Gauls during that whole conflict. So, fair enough, I guess. Caesar's Gallic triumph kicked off with wagons carrying paintings depicting Caesar's various victories over the Gauls. Mm -hmm. These were followed by even more wagons hauling captured Gallic treasure. Walking alongside these wagons were an assortment of Gallic prisoners, including the so-called King of the Gauls, Vercingetorix. This is what I'm saying about the uh, triumph in regards to North Africa. Caesar certainly, he's not going to walk Roman prisoners through the streets of Rome, so he's, what, he's going to find some Numidians? He's going to bring King Juba up? <laughs> I mean, that would just be a complete farce, because the victory in North Africa wasn't actually against King Juba. Uh, it, it was against fellow Romans, you know, the remaining Pompeians. Um, but 
I don't think he'd march captured Romans through the streets, or if he did, that would be an extremely bad taste. After this, Caesar made his entrance by crossing the Pomerium and making his way up the Via Sacra before cheering crowds. As the name would imply, the Via Sacra was home to Rome's largest temples. Mm. As Caesar was passing the temple to Fortuna, the goddess of luck, one of the wheels on his chariot snapped and he was uh -oh. thrown onto the street. To the superstitious Romans, it appeared that the goddess of luck had finally abandoned Caesar. Yeah, that's After bad. a brief delay, another chariot was found and the triumph continued. As I mean, for the extremely superstitious and religious Romans, that's gotta be a bad omen. I mean, that's a bad sign. Caesar approached the Gallic Triumph's grand finale. He decided to climb the steps to the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on his knees in an act of penance. Hopefully, the Goddess of Luck would find this pleasing. Okay. After this bit of public humiliation, Vercingetorix, the so-called King of the Gauls, having played his part, was strangled to death. Jesus. And now, I mean, I understand the Romans love this stuff, but there's something truly, truly morbid about keeping someone alive. Anybody, really, but especially such an important leader alive for six years just to be murdered during a military celebration. And this is what I was saying. Histori Civilis brought this up in his video on triumphs. The Romans hated human sacrifice, and they would say this absolutely wasn't human sacrifice, but we have this military and religious ceremony. Caesar has just, on his knees, made his way up to a temple, and now Vercingetorix has been executed. Now, I do feel you're coming uncomfortably close to human sacrifice. Even if not that, it seems very distasteful, you know, to me, and I'm sure a lot of you. Now, keep in mind, this is very different time, different culture, etc., etc. Um, but, I mean, to be fair, I'm sure Burson Jetterix wasn't happy about it either. <laughs> the rest of the Gallic prisoners met the same fate. An important part of the triumph is that Caesar's soldiers were permitted to cross the Pomerium and follow behind him along the triumphal route. Yeah. By the end of the triumph, everybody was pretty loose, if you know what I mean. And it was <laughs> customary for the soldiers to entertain the crowd by singing rude songs. Oh. Suetonius, writing 150 years after the fact, had access to sources that are now lost to us, and mm. went to the trouble of transcribing one of the songs that Caesar's Ooh. army sang during the Gallic Triumph. Great. It went something like this. Romans, watch your wives. <laughs> Here's the bald adulterous whore. We pissed away your golden gall and come to borrow more. Wow, that's uh... Not quite what I thought they were going to sing. <laughs> a few days later, after the partying had settled down a bit, it was time for the Egyptian triumph. Mm. As part of the negotiated settlement with Egypt, Caesar had taken Cleopatra's sister and former rival Arsinoe captive. Mm. Arsinoe was a former queen herself, and as such, she would become the second monarch to walk in one of Caesar's triumphs. By all accounts, Arsinoe was young, charming, attractive, and probably fluent in both Greek and Latin. We don't know exactly what she said or did, but whatever it was, the crowd immediately took a liking to her. Oh, of Before course. too long, people were calling on Caesar to spare her life. <laughs> Caesar, sensing the mood of the crowd, gave in to popular demand and- I mean, look, Caesar's always been good with PR, um, so. Others, I would expect to stick to their guns and go through with the execution, but Caesar, uh, I think, can sense the mood of the crowd and the mood of the public well enough. And allowed Arsinoe to take up residence in a Roman temple. Wow, she gets There's to live. There's no doubt that this move annoyed Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it geopolitically, Rome having a potential heir to the Egyptian throne in their back pocket seems like a pretty smart move. That's true. Um, I don't know if Caesar was thinking about that. Presuming he planned to actually execute Arsinoe, um, then he didn't have it in mind. But, you know, maybe he'd already planned something like this. We don't truly know. Um, but if Caesar had that in mind, very intelligent. If he didn't, you know, very lucky. I guess the goddess of luck still is on his side because it just happens that, yeah, having Arsinoe in Roman captivity, that is definitely a chip you could play against the Egyptians later 
if you wanted to. A few days later, it was time for the Asia Minor Triumph, which celebrated Caesar's five-day campaign that ended with the Battle of Zella. This would have been the weakest of the four triumphs. Yeah, I was going to say, this is the lamest <laughs> of the triumphs. This isn't really celebrating too much. And it's probably no coincidence that none of the ancient sources have anything to say about it. Hmm. Oh, here we go. I'm very curious to see how this goes. Um... Maybe Caesar will be able to navigate this successfully. I'm not sure how much the people of Rome know about what actually happened during the North African campaign. Um, if they're aware of what happened, then, you know, I feel like they're probably going to think this is, you know, uh, at best a farce and at worst straight up insulting. But if the people of Rome don't know, if uh, the news hasn't been spread, if they don't really know what happened, if it's unclear to them, then Caesar could definitely swing this in a light that's positive, favorable to him. And then, a few days later, it was time for the grand finale, the North African Triumph. This triumph was pitched as a celebration of Caesar's victory over King Juba and the Numidians in North Africa. Mm. As usual, the triumph kicked off with a bunch of giant paintings. One of the first paintings depicted the Pompeian general Scipio stabbing himself in the oh, stomach no. and tossing himself into the sea. Oh no! Oh no! This is exactly what I hoped Caesar wouldn't do! I think I literally said earlier, you know, well, I don't think Caesar wouldn't, you know, parade Roman prisoners or celebrate uh, defeating other Romans, or if he did, it would be in very bad taste. Well, I was wrong. He's doing it. I don't know if he's going to bring Roman prisoners. That would be even worse. But even just the paintings, Caesar is trying to make this triumph, which he claims is about King Juba, a celebration of the defeat of fellow Romans. Um, yeah, I'll reiterate, incredibly bad taste right after a civil war. Um, you know, if we've learned anything from many civil wars, the, the best thing to do in most cases is to go for reconciliation. And, and so far, Caesar's been pretty good with that, though we, we did see some um, brutal, uh, some brutality from his men uh, recently after the end of the campaign in North Africa. But uh, this is, I just don't think this is a good idea. Many in the crowd understandably found this painting offensive. Why were they being shown the deaths of Romans? Where were the Numidians? Minutes later, another painting came into view. This one depicted the last moments of Cato's life, with the Ooh. senator laying in bed, ripping out his own intestines with his bare hands. Bro, these paintings are brutal as well, oh my god. Now look, uh, there's a lot to dislike about Cato, I'm not really a fan, but, and I'm sure a lot of the people in this crowd were not a fan of Cato, but this is way too far. Um, and, and with how gory it sounds like the image was, although maybe this could be exaggerated by later sources, yeah, this is just terrible, terrible PR from Caesar, who is, you know, typically pretty damn good at this stuff. This was disgusting, even by Roman standards. It was now crystal clear that Caesar was much more concerned with celebrating the deaths of his fellow Romans than he was with the defeat of the Numidians. Not the crowd good. turned against the triumph. Uh oh. Minutes later, the prisoners came into view. The most prominent person here was the new king of Numidia, a okay. young child, probably under the age of six. Oh. This child would be the third monarch to walk in one of Caesar's oh. triumphs. Which, yeah, I mean, it is a Numidian, not a Roman, which is good, but this is <laughs> literally a small child. <laughs> I mean, this, this can't play well with the crowd. Which was an incredible accomplishment, and a record that would never be broken. But the crowd had no interest in this achievement. They were in a sour mood, and found the idea of putting an innocent child to yeah. death repulsive. The crowd started to get rowdy, and when Caesar came into view, they uh -oh. angrily demanded that he spare the boy's life. Caesar didn't have much of a choice. He enrolled yeah. the young king in a prestigious school and left it at that. <laughs> I'm really surprised that Caesar thought that would be a good idea. Maybe, I don't know, this is really unlike him, I would say. Maybe the planning got out of his control, or 
I guess maybe he just was really into it. I mean, he finally finished the Civil War, and he felt like he deserved a celebration. I mean, he asked for the four triumphs in the first place, which I don't really think was a good idea. So clearly, I think Caesar's ego was very inflated at this point. I mean, it always is, but in this moment in particular, it seems that his ego had really gotten in the way of intelligent political operating, because this was not a good idea. When you add together each of Caesar's four triumphs, he hauled 2,000 tons of silver across hey, the Pomerium. Uh, that is good, though. I mean, people are going to like that. Currency conversion across two millennia is pretty much impossible, mm. but just so you get a proper sense of scale, that much silver would be worth a billion dollars today. The scale of Caesar's personal wealth had grown to that of a small country, and it was time to use that wealth to begin meeting some of his mm -hmm. obligations. At the top of his list were his legions, who, in return for sacrificing so much, had received nothing but a bunch of promises. Yeah, remarkably, due to um, being, aside from what just happened, an intelligent political operator uh, and being generally pretty charismatic, Caesar has managed to get a lot from a lot of people, especially his legions, without giving really anything back. So now he's going to have to pay up, uh, and he's got a lot of people to pay. Caesar gifted each of his soldiers one silver talent, which, bearing in mind that currency conversion is pretty much impossible, would have been equal to like 10 or 15 years wow. wages. Centurions were given two silver talents, and officers and command staff were given four silver talents. I mean, that's a good this reward. This was extremely generous, and everybody knew full well that this was coming right out of Caesar's pocket. That is going to make the legions happy. Um, this is also... I don't know if this is really the start of this trend, because it's not going to get bad for at least another 100, 150 years, but we do see a trend, particularly in mid to late Imperial Roman history, of emperors doling out bigger and bigger cash prizes to their armies, um, which they increasingly can't afford, and this will become a really big problem. But we've got, a, we've got, like I said, at least 100 years, uh, if not more, until that point. Um, so it's not really an issue right now. But the spending spree was just getting started, because Caesar then turned around and gifted every Roman citizen the equivalent of like four months' wages. Whoa. This was a surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. Now, I mean, this is, it's a pretty blatant popularity move, but can you imagine if something similar happened today? I mean... I guess we got the stimulus checks during COVID. Um, I guess that's sort of equivalent, though that was during a, a time of crisis. I'm not sure if the comparison really works, but hey, people did really like those stimmy checks, right? So imagine if not even during a time of crisis, but just sort of out of nowhere, unexpectedly, um, not only the government, but an individual figure just doled out that much money to everybody. I mean, people would be very pleased. <laughs> the Roman aristocracy looked down their noses at this blatant political pandering, but since it was a private donation, they were in no position <laughs> to do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, a private donation, a private donation to everybody in the city. <laughs> Despite this flurry of generosity, Caesar's full debt to his soldiers had not yet been paid. This is a rough estimate, but something on the order of 22,000 soldiers were currently up for retirement, and that number would only grow in the years to come. Mm. The Roman state owed every one of these men a plot of farmland and a cash bonus. And yep, and that's how it worked back in Rome. Um, I mean, this is the idea of the citizen soldier. Um, and this is one of the things that made the Roman Republic's army so strong. Um, and so well trained and so disciplined, the idea that you are a citizen of the Republic, uh, you should serve your years in the army, and when you're done, the state grants you a plot of farmland, some cash, you can retire, raise a family. Um, and that's also, you know, that was seen as very virtuous, both for the average soldier and for the important political figure or general, Cincinnatus, 
Uh, you know, he's sort of the example of a very successful general who had it all and then retired back to his farm uh, to tend to his crops, raise a family, and live the quiet life. George Washington is also call- is often called the American Cincinnatus. Um, so this is sort of a very common idea in Roman history. And at this point, still pretty um, realistic, I would say. And it was Caesar's responsibility to make sure that happened. But 22,000 is a big number. And even with unlimited funds, coming up with that much farmland would be tough. This mm. would require a political solution. Well, Caesar's pretty good at those. Luckily, Caesar was at the height of his political power. He had just been appointed dictator for an additional 10 years, and was at the very beginning of a five-year run as consul. His first move was to push a bill through the Senate, setting up a mechanism through which farmers could sell their land to the government at inflated prices. Mm. This meant that Rome's failing farmers would be eligible for a little cash bailout. Of course, since this was a voluntary program, the full redistribution of 22,000 farms would take many, many years. Now that Caesar's veterans were being dealt with, some- Caesar's new MO is presented with a problem? Hey, just chuck money at it. And I mean, hey, fair enough. Caesar has been struggling to pay off people for years. He finally has this fortune. Uh, he's using it. Important political decisions needed to be made. The chaos of the Civil War had devastated the Senate. Yeah. The size of the Senate tended to fluctuate year to year, but if you assumed perfect health and attendance, it could top out at like 800 members. Although in practice, 300 was pretty typical. As you- <laughs> I mean, geez, already. Uh, uh, Story Civilis says approximately at the bottom of the screen. But if that is accurate, we're talking your typical attendance for your legislature is less than half. Um, imagine if we saw those attendance rates these days. That would be pretty shocking, or at least in the United States. I don't know what attendance rates for other countries are, but if we saw that in Congress, that would be extremely shocking. You might imagine the Civil War had pushed a lot of senators into early retirement. Though to be fair, I say that, but... You know, Congress holds a bunch of committees and hearings and blah, 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 and almost no one attends them. You might get a couple uh, of Congress people. So, in reality, for a lot of the functioning of our legislature, most of our congressional representatives uh, and senators actually don't attend. And, well, death. And by the year 46, Senate membership was down in the danger zone. Some back-of-the-envelope calculations said that there would not be enough qualified senators to properly staff Rome's provinces. Yikes. Caesar would do three things to solve this problem. He would expand the pool of available candidates, he would widen the filter that produced qualified candidates, and he would temporarily lower the qualifications themselves. Hmm. This whole thing was super consequential, and it would ruffle a lot of feathers. So yeah, I mean, he... This is sort of one of these political decisions that has a lot of unintended or maybe intended uh, consequences. So Caesar, it, it seems like his main motivation is to reintroduce more senators to the Senate, which is sort of crumbling. There's very few senators. But, and I don't know if he intended this or not, what he's also doing is further democratizing the Senate. Now, it's still really not that democratic. It's still going to be a body of elites, but he's opening it up to more people. It's going to be slightly less elite. You know, that will definitely have big consequences down the road. So let's get into it. Caesar widened the pool of available candidates by using his dictatorial powers to unilaterally appoint hundreds and hundreds of new senators. Oh, wow. So that is more straightforward than I thought. <laughs> um... You know, I thought we'd be widening the election process or something like that, but just appointing people, uh, very heavy-handed, but uh, that seems to be what Caesar's doing lately. Who were these new senators? They were basically everybody that Caesar had come into contact with over the last 15 years. A bunch of these new senators were retired centurions from his legions. It goes without saying that these guys were loyalists. Mm-hmm. He also appointed a bunch of aristocrats from the small and medium-sized cities that dotted the Italian countryside. 
Caesar had turned to this group for financial support during yep. the Civil War, and this political kickback only strengthened their loyalty to him. Smart. It was a that, that was a really intelligent political move. Caesar managed to get really necessary loans while also developing a loyal base of these countryside aristocrats. You know, he could have created a situation where they were very mad at him <laughs> for taking so much money, but instead he got the money, made them loyal to him, and now he's only reinforcing that. You know, really intelligent. Canny move, since these aristocrats were pretty influential. And some of these new senators came from outside Italy Ooh. during the Gallic Wars. The the senators who were already in the Senate, the these patrician elites, um, primarily from the Italian peninsula, they are not going to be happy about this. Caesar had made commitments to some Gallic aristocrats in exchange for their support. But this is, and this is what Rome does over time, and they will continue to do this, you know, they expand Roman identity to include other peoples. Now, this is sort of the very beginning of including Gauls uh, in their idea of Rome. Eventually, citizenship will be extended to the Gauls and a lot of other groups of people. But this is sort of the beginning of that very important process, which I think is a big factor in Rome surviving for as long as it did. Appointing these Gauls to the Roman Senate was a way of finally making good on these commitments. Let's make a few things clear about these Gauls. For starters, these people had been given Roman citizenship ages ago. Mm. They were fluent in Latin. They wore Roman clothing. So these are very Romanized Gauls, but still Gauls nonetheless. And I mean, I think this model absolutely works, you know, expanding your culture and citizenship through values, culture, assimilation. But you know, this certainly will be controversial to a lot of uh, Roman Italian patricians. Their children got Roman educations. Nevertheless, the appointment of ethnic Gauls to the Roman Senate caused an uproar. I'm sure. On the streets of Rome, people started telling a joke that went something like this. The Gauls have crossed the Pomerium. They're asking for directions to the <laughs> Senate House. That's pretty good. There was a lot of loose talk at the time about senators showing up unable to speak Latin, sporting Gallic facial hair, wearing Gallic clothing. See, I mean, that's just basic xenophobia, discrimination, racism, whatever you want to call it. Maybe xenophobia is the best term. It, that's probably ridiculous. Just in Gallic religion, but none of this was true. It was all just wild paranoia. Yeah. By the time Caesar had finished making all of his appointments, the Senate had quadrupled in size. Over Whoa. time, the Senate would shrink back down to normal, but this would take at least a generation. As I said before, Caesar had good reasons for packing the Senate, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that at its heart, this was a power grab. The vast majority of the Roman Senate were now personally loyal to Caesar. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean... There's a couple of consequences, you know, he's sort of reforming the Senate after it's been so badly depopulated. He is, uh, in some ways, making the Senate a little less elitist, a little. Um, whether those are intended or unintended consequences, clearly the main thing Caesar is doing is bolstering his own power base. Um, I mean, the Senate will become less and less important over time, but... He's making sure that the Senate is packed with people who are loyal to him. This is a power grab, an authoritarian power grab. I agree with the story of Illus that is absolutely worth pointing out, though at this point, an authoritarian power grab is nothing new to Roman politics and nothing new to Caesar. But the Senate packing thing wouldn't entirely solve the problem at hand. The only senators that were allowed to serve as governors were the ones who had been elected to one of Rome's two highest offices, consul and mm. praetor. Because of the civil war, many of Rome's former consuls and praetors were either dead or retired. It would take quite a long time to filter this expanded pool of politicians up the cursus honorum. So Caesar widened the filter by increasing the number of annually elected praetors from eight to 10. Hmm. But widening the filter wouldn't entirely solve the problem either. As a stopgap measure, Caesar used his dictatorial authority to appoint a bunch of underqualified politicians to the provinces. 
Caesar's old job as governor of Cisalpine Gaul went to one of the Senate's lowest ranked senators, Marcus wow. Brutus. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, I didn't think that's where we were heading. Um, as those of you who are even vaguely familiar with Caesar will know, uh, Brutus is someone we must keep an eye on. But it's worth pointing out right here that, you know, Brutus's career is currently being made by Caesar. Uh, he owes Caesar a lot. Um, you know, this will theoretically cement his loyalty to Caesar, and to some extent it will. But, uh, of course, Brutus is uh, a lot more complicated than that. Fifteen years his junior, Brutus was the son of Caesar's favorite mistress. And despite the fact that Brutus had sided with the Pompeians during the Civil War, Caesar was happy to take him under his wing. Caesar also singled out ten loyal former preachers, and awarded them with something called the dignity of a former consul. This was a totally made up thing. But Caesar argued that it would be improper for certain provinces to be governed by anybody lacking the dignity of a former consul. Yeah, okay. In truth, it was just a way for Caesar to reward his allies for their years yeah. of service. Whatever. Yeah, this is some typical political machine stuff. Uh, rewarding all your allies, political kickbacks, uh, very reminiscent of early 18th century, mid-18th century, or, jeez Louise, mid-19th century American politics. You know, we're talking mid-1800s, cities like Boston, New York, uh, a lot of stuff like this. Uh, this That's completely unrelated, but, you know, we're talking a very corrupt system with a lot of political kickbacks. Caesar packaged these power-grabby political reforms with some more general anti-corruption stuff. This included a provision that said that any governor convicted on corruption charges would be automatically expelled from the Senate. This fight against corruption was one of Caesar's hobby horses. Mm -hmm. He believed that corrupt governors needlessly antagonized the locals, which put Rome at risk. The corrupt aristocracy did not much like these reforms, but they yeah, weren't sure. in a position to do anything about it. I mean, look, if you just want good governance, um, it doesn't need to be a moral crusade. If you want a well-functioning state, well-functioning bureaucracy, then you're going to be anti-corruption. Corruption is absolutely corrosive and eats away at a well-functioning bureaucracy. So, you know, obviously, I don't think Caesar is going on some moral crusade about corruption. Uh, in many ways, he's extremely corrupt himself, but I think he's right to go after this. Um, and, I mean, we've seen some figures like Cicero who are politically anti-corruption sort of, you know, feed into the corruption themselves because it's just the way you rise through the ranks in Rome. It's how you gain political power. Uh, it's endemic to Roman political culture, and Caesar's trying to... Decrease that at least a little bit. Taken as a whole, this was a staggering number of reforms to come down all at once. Yeah. That's how it felt at the time, too. Most of these bills were conceived and written up in Caesar's home, and would only see the light of day when it was time for the Senate to provide their rubber stamp. I mean, there's no, like, it's not... There's no pretending at this point. There's no pretending that the institutions of the Republic still function normally. You know, if bills are being drawn up in Caesar's home and hand-delivered to the Senate, you know, everybody knows what's going on. Also, just a, a bad sign for the functioning of your republic, which isn't really a republic anymore. <laughs> I mean, Republican name only. Cicero even notes that a few of these proposals showed up with his own name attached to them, which was oh. quite the surprise. Yeah, that's sneaky. Now that the immediate political problems were out of the way, Caesar turned his eye to the public. Mm. Rome had a ton of systemic issues that had been in a state of neglect since before the Civil War. The largest of these, and the one that had the most direct impact on the lives of everyday citizens, was the grain dole. Mm. Quite simply, the grain dole provided free or subsidized grain for Rome's poorest citizens at the state's expense. The significance of the grain dole is kind of hard to wrap your head around, so think of it like this. For... Well, we're talking welfare, basically. Um, I mean, in this, it's giving food out, but it is welfare, um, which is pretty remarkable. <laughs> and if we look at... He might be about to say what I'm going to say, but if we look at human history, 
Uh, if we look at what's to follow the collapse of Rome, the Dark Ages, uh, you know, medieval Europe, um, there is really no state institution such as this for a very long time after the collapse of Rome. I mean, really, up until the modern era, we're talking 17, 1800s, most of this stuff will become private charity or will be done through the church. This sort of state-sponsored welfare will be extremely obscure uh, up until more than a thousand years after the collapse of Rome. Um, and this is true for most of history. So it's truly remarkable that Rome has a sort of welfare system like this. It shows how well developed the empire and its political institutions were. Um, really, I don't know if you call it ahead of their time, because history is not this linear progression of events, but pretty unique in human history. Um, he might be about to say that exact same thing. For most of world history, most people spent most of their money on food. True. The grain dole took 320,000 of Rome's poorest citizens and eliminated their largest household expense. Mm. This was one of the most effective government-run anti-poverty programs in world history. And frankly, nobody would improve on it until basically the modern welfare state. That's exactly what I said. I mean, look, think about something like the French Revolution. There were a lot of causes for the French Revolution, but one of the big causes was that food was getting too expensive. Um, you know, there were shortages of grain. Therefore, the price of bread rose precipitously, and regular people couldn't afford to buy food. People were dying of starvation. And that was one of the things that encouraged people to rise up and turn to violence, get out into the streets. In Rome, if the grain dole functions effectively, right? If it functions effectively, that's a big if. You can avoid a lot of political conflict. You can avoid a lot of protest, uh, a lot of, you know, people becoming desperate and turning to violence. Um, and this is extremely rare in human history. That's why it's so remarkable. And like Story Sevilla said, he reiterated the point that I had just made. You really won't see something this effective until the modern age, until the last couple of hundred years. But after years of neglect, cracks were beginning to show. Poor citizens were having a hard time getting onto the grain dole without mm. bribing bureaucrats. Okay, so it's not working effectively at this point. This was made worse by the fact that families who maybe a generation earlier had qualified for the grain dole were able to keep their names on the lists long after rising out of poverty. Rich people were collecting benefits that were intended for poor people. <laughs> uh -oh. This was, I mean, hey, that is something that has remained uh, through the present. We see a lot of that today during the pandemic, the PPP loans, a lot of this stuff. We see, uh, we saw a lot of rich people taking benefits that uh, they did not need. <laughs> leading to a lot of social resentment. I'm sure see it, it leads to a lot of social resentment today. <laughs> Caesar dramatically restructured the grain dole. He cut the number of eligible recipients in half, from 320,000 to 150,000. But he okay. also implemented stronger political oversight, so that these 150,000 people were legitimately Rome's poorest citizens. This restored a basic sense of fairness to the system, and dis Yeah, I mean, usually cutting welfare like that uh, is not very popular, but if your welfare system uh, is so corrupt and dysfunctional, you know, if you cut it, but also make sure that it actually works, you know, that could be a winner with the public, and it looks like people are liking that move. Despite the fact that a lot less people would qualify for the benefit, the reforms turned out to be quite popular. When Brutus learned of Caesar's cuts, he excitedly wrote to a friend, saying that Caesar appears to be joining the <laughs> conservative faction. That friend conveyed Brutus's thoughts to Cicero, who responded, Join the conservative faction. Is he planning on killing himself? <laughs> yeah, I... One, yeah, Caesar's not joining the conservative faction. Two, Caesar's just doing what he thinks is effective. He's always made his own way. Three, you know, there's not much of a conservative faction left. There is sort of an underground anti-Caesar opposition that will rise through the years. Um, looking at you, Brutus, but... You know, the idea that Caesar's joining the conservative faction is not, it's just not realistic.
now that Caesar's major reforms were up and running, he was free to take on a brand new super secret project. Oh. This would be an utterly boring and thankless job, but it was something that had captured Caesar's imagination a while back, and okay. for whatever reason, he was hellbent on tackling it now. We're talking about the Roman calendar. Ah, okay, so uh, presumably we come back to the title of this video, The Longest Year in Human History, and we have seen in previous videos how the Roman calendar is totally out of whack <laughs> because Caesar was supposed to be tending to it, um, but he'd kind of forgotten in his years of battling against the Gauls and other Romans. Uh, and so the Roman calendar is, all, like the Dole, dysfunctional at this point. Um, and of course, we've all heard of the Julian calendar, so uh, Caesar is going to do some pretty important reforms here, I think. We don't need to go into all the details, but for starters, it was a lunar calendar, as in it followed the phases of the moon. The phases of the moon do not line up with the solar year, which means that lunar calendars always drift out of sync with the seasons. It was the job of the Pontifex Maximus and his College of Pontiffs to monitor this drift and to manually add days to the calendar as needed. Yep. The current Pont. Yeah, and who was the Pontifex Maximus? I wonder. Well, we're about to see. Pontifex Maximus happened to be Julius Caesar. And yep. as we know, Caesar had been indisposed for like a decade and a half. <laughs> as a consequence, the Roman calendar was a good three months out of sync. Whoa, which... that's even worse than I thought. Though, to be fair, uh, when we checked in on Caesar last time and the calendar, which I think was a few years before this, the calendar was already maybe a month or a month and a half out of sync, so I guess I shouldn't be so surprised that it's gotten so bad. As far as calendars go, is kind of a catastrophic failure. But Caesar had just spent the better- I mean, Yeah, that means you're basically, your calendar's in the wrong season. Three months? Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> part of a year in Egypt, where he learned that the Egyptians used a nearly perfect 365-day huh. solar calendar. Interesting. Caesar enlisted the help of an Egyptian astronomer named Sosignes of Alexandria, and together they designed a new Roman calendar loosely modeled on the Egyptian system. Like the Egyptian calendar, the new Roman calendar would be 365 days. Good start. But the Egyptian calendar did have some flaws. They evenly divided the year into 12 months of 30 days each, which adds up to 360. And then they manually added in five extra days at the end of the year to make mm. the math work. Those five extra days were a problem. Under the Roman system, these days would be administered by the Pontifex Maximus. And if administered incorrectly, the calendar would begin to drift again. That would not do. Caesar and Sosignes wanted this new calendar to run on autopilot, so they took those five extra days and peppered them throughout the year, creating a bunch of 31-day months. The month of February was considered unlucky, and for superstitious reasons, they bumped it back to 28 days. We're beginning to see some very familiar elements, aren't we? As it had been under the old system, and offset this with even more 31-day months. But according to Sosignes, even the nearly perfect Egyptian calendar was slightly out of alignment, mm -hmm. since it did not take into account the actual length of the year, which was 365 and a quarter days. Under the old Roman calendar, the traditional place to insert extra days had been during the month of February, and so Caesar and Sosignes invented a system where an additional day would be automatically inserted into that month on every fourth year. They made here. it very clear that this was not one of those extra days that the Pontifex Maximus could tinker with. This would be an automatic process, out yep. of the hands of the politicians. And now we're seeing a calendar that is very similar in some ways to ours. This is the Julian calendar that was used for, uh, I'd say, more than a thousand years um, until it was replaced by the Gregorian calendar, which is sort of a modification of the Julian calendar. Uh, and the Gregorian calendar is what, what most of us use today. So basically, most of us are using a modified version of this calendar. Um, you know, like I said, it is different. It's a, the Gregorian calendar. But in many ways, what Caesar established uh, at this point, roughly 2,000 years ago, uh, is what a lot of us are still running on today. So, hey, good job. 
With that, the new Roman calendar was complete, but there was still a problem. The current date was still three months out of alignment. That's a problem. So here's a trivia question that you can bore your friends with. What was the longest year in human <laughs> history? Seems like a trick, but it's not. In order to bring the Roman year back into alignment, Caesar inserted 90 extra days into the year 46 BCE, making wow. it a 445 day year, which was 25% longer than normal. God damn, imagine if you lived through that. <laughs> All of a sudden, you know, your calendar's so out of whack that the government <laughs> adds an extra 90 days to the year. That would be such a... I mean, I know in real terms it doesn't necessarily have impacts, but that would just feel weird, I think, to everybody to not have the year end when you would expect it to have another 90 days. That would be so strange. On January 1st of the year 45, the new Roman calendar, which is known to us as the Julian calendar, came into effect. Automating the calendar and getting it out of the hands of politicians was a great human achievement. Yeah. Aside from some minor upgrades in the 16th century. Uh, I'm reading on the screen, drifted out of alignment, Gregorian calendar. Okay, there we go. This is what I was talking about, 1582. So the Julian calendar lasted unchanged, basically, until the 1500s. So for 1500 years. Uh, and then the Gregorian calendar is what we use today. But the Gregorian calendar is just a modified version of the Julian calendar. So we basically use the framework that Caesar established 2,000 years ago. And like Astoria Sevilla said... Yeah, it's a great achievement for Caesar and for the Romans, but it's a great human achievement for everybody. So that's pretty awesome. The system devised by Caesar and Sosigenes survives more or less intact to this day. Hmm. Wow. While Caesar was busy in Rome, something was happening out in the provinces. Uh-oh. Without warning, the Spanish governors began writing in, requesting reinforcements. Before Caesar could even act, Rome's two Spanish provinces had fallen to the enemy. What enemy? Yo, what enemy? Caesar's old right-hand man, Labinus, had- No, wow, Labinus is really becoming the, the arch-villain, huh? Or maybe the underdog hero, depending on your perspective, but he's really becoming the main antagonist against Caesar. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was already kind of shocking enough when Labinus decided to ditch Caesar at the start of the Civil War, but- now he is Caesar's main enemy. Had joined forces with two of Pompey's sons. Rome's disgruntled Spanish legions had eagerly gone over to their side. Caesar had been caught entirely flat-footed. Apparently, the Roman Civil War wasn't over yet. Jeez. Wait for the outro song. There we go. Always gotta let the outro song play for a little bit. Um, wow. More Civil War, though. Let's be honest, it's more like just a regional rebellion at this point. Uh, the Civil War is basically over. Uh, I'm sure Caesar wishes all this was over. It's kind of getting a little tiring that Pompeian factions continue to pop up throughout the Empire. I guess that's what happens when you have such a divisive Civil War, but this seems like more of a rebellion. I'm not sure how large-scale this will be. I guess we'll find out next time. Yeah, I really enjoy this one. Uh, some more uh, Caesar in Rome, more Caesar politicking. I always enjoy that stuff. I know a lot of you guys too. Uh, a lot of you guys do as well. <laughs> you know, mushing my words together today. Um, but yeah, if you guys enjoyed this one, uh, once again, I'd really appreciate it. If you would become a channel member, just hit that join button right next to the subscribe button. You will get at the $5 tier exclusive reaction content many Historia Civilis reactions, and more exclusive reactions to come in the future. Uh, so yeah, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.